So, my name is Hakan Fors. Uh, I'm a Lean Agile coach from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, I've been using Scrum and XP for some time, but lately I've been using more of a, the Kanban method uh, because I've kind of really got bitten by this Lean bug uh, and uh, use Lean and Lean thinking of how to improve the way of working. Uh, I'm also very passionate about cycling, and I know there's a presentation, I think, next up uh, with uh, Tour de France, which is great. And we also have uh, the great uh, race that was recently Paris-Roubaix. Uh, I'm also very passionate about uh, gas grills and, uh, and barbecue. <laughs> um, and there's a TV series in Sweden where a guy, he cooks all the time, uh, and it could be me. <laughs> But let's get into the meat of things. Uh, let, let me tell you a story about these two girls, uh, Maria and Anna. Uh, and we're going to experience them when they go through the Swedish healthcare system. So, Maria, it's Monday morning. She's getting uh, ready to go to, to work. And to her dismay, she discovers she has a, a lump in, in her breast. And she gets worried, of course, because uh, breast cancer is the, the most common cancer and the, uh, the biggest killer of Swedish women in terms of cancer in Sweden. She, she tried to contact her uh, uh, local health, uh, health uh, uh, institution. So... She actually gets a time with her local family doctor the next day. She meets the family doctor and he examines her. Uh, but unfortunately, he can't rule out if this is cancer or not. So he needs to refer her to a specialist where they should do uh, an ultrasound and uh, a mammogram. So she gets sent home and uh, told that there will be uh, an appointment uh, in the mail. She's quite worried, uh, checks her mail every day, uh, and after uh, 10 days, she kind of uh, wants to know what happens, so she actually calls up uh, and asks, how is uh, the referral going? Uh, when will I have the time? So this very nice nurse starts digging through all the papers, and finally she actually finds uh, her referral, uh, and she says, I will process this, this today and uh, I will try to get you a, a time very soon. Four days later, she gets uh, the actual referral for a time and a few days later, uh, she actually gets to the doctor. She meets the doctor, he, do, he does the mammogram and also the, also the ultrasound. Uh, and unfortunately, he can't rule out that she has breast cancer. He needs to uh, have some additional tissue samples to do this. So he asked ask her to go home again and, and wait for a new referral to uh, a cytologist. And she's waiting at home. She's getting very sick of worry and uh, she's can't really think, what was the doctor really saying where I'm supposed to just wait for the referral or should uh, the referral, uh, should I actually contact them to book a time? So once again, she calls, uh, she calls uh, and eventually she gets time and she meets uh, with this uh, breast surgeon and he analyzes the, the sample uh, and eventually she needs to uh, get into uh, to this cytologist and eventually she actually get the referral she gets into to this uh, to the cytologist and he, what he does is to take the tissue sample uh, and he says to her she he needs to send it off for analysis and because the lab is also very busy it will take some time and he actually doesn't really know when we will get the result. So she sends her home again. And eventually, after six weeks, she gets back to the, uh, the doctor again 
and he has the results and give her a diagnosis if she has a cancer or not. Let's talk about Anna. Anna has, it's Tuesday morning, she's in the shower and she also discovers a lump in her breast and she's really sick or worry and during the day uh, she talks uh, with a friend uh, and she tells her about this one-stop breast clinic uh, close by and just after lunch she goes back to her computer and he fi she finds this one-stop breast clinic and he finds out on Thursday night it's actually open so she uh, decides to go there Thursday night comes she goes there she meets with uh, a nurse she makes a quick examin examination and says well, I can't determine if this is cancer or not, so you need to see uh, a specialist. She's sent back to the waiting room, uh, expecting to be there for a few hours, but uh, very soon she's called in by the doctor and he makes the initial examination and he can't really rule out cancer in this case either. So she says, please go back to the waiting room uh, and we will do uh, an ultrasound and a uh, mammogram. She goes back to the waiting room, uh, also expecting to be there for a while, but just after a few minutes, a specialist nurse comes out and they go to do the mammogram. Uh, and then she takes her directly to uh, a doctor, a specialist, that they makes the ultrasound. And they can't rule out uh, cancer in this case either. She's sent back to the waiting room again and waiting to get into the cytologist and get the, the tissue sample. Just a few minutes later, she actually gets into this doctor again uh, and they make the tissue sample. And that is sent off and they have a result. So the difference between these two processes are in time counted for Maria, it took over a thousand hours from when she discovered this until she got the diagnosis. And we haven't even get into the treatment. And for Anna, it took less than 60 hours if you count uh, the time uh, before as well. So what's the difference between these two processes? It's actually just two different business strategies. And these two business strategies are either focused on uh, High resource efficiency, which means uh, we are focusing of, on having our resources in the sy system busy as much as possible to drive down cost. That means that we need to keep a queue of work in front of our workers. We need to keep them busy all the time. And of course we need to have a queue of work between the workers as well, so the next worker will not run out of time out of work when they're doing. So this is optimizing your way of working in your organization towards keeping your people uh, busy all the time. So that is resource efficiency and the strategy here is to try to reach kind of nirvana of the processes through being resource efficiency first and then eventually we'll strive towards uh, the flow efficiency. But in Anna's case, they had a bis another dif uh, business strategy, and that is flow efficiency first before we try to strive for resource efficiency. To achieve this, we have work, uh, but we are looking in the customer's perspective and trying to flow the value through the system as fast as possible. Therefore, we try to avoid to have queues between the different stages in the process. And that might mean that the next worker might be waiting for some time, but they are always ready to take on the work when it arrives. And both these are two different business strategies and they are both aiming to go towards Nirvana. Uh, and the flow efficiency route is what's called lean. You start with flow efficiency first, and when you have flow efficiency on a reasonable level, you try to strive up towards uh, resource efficiency as well. But of course, getting to Nirvana is more or less impossible, and the experience that uh, we have is going
going for resource efficiency first is actually much, much harder uh, than, uh, and then moving towards flow efficiency and then starting with flow efficiency first. So if you would guess which one of these two processes is the most expensive one, and these are based on actual processes in Sweden. Any guesses? So they are actually more or less in terms of cost the same. So there's really no benefic beneficial way of doing the one, the one or the other. Uh, so it's more of how you treat your customers. Do you want your customers to be in agony and don't get the diagnosis for a thousand hours? Or do you want your customers to get the diagnosis in less than 60 hours? So the question is, so we can look at, at this value stream here, and this is for the Maria's process. We have uh, the green ones is uh, value adding work. And that means that we are adding value to the customer. Uh, and we have some of them spread out in this, uh, in this uh, process. We also have the non-value adding work that is mainly waiting time. Uh, we also have the non-value added work but required. Uh, that might be things that we need to do to operate the process how it's set up right now. But it's actually not adding any value. So common red bricks in your system would be waiting in queues. If we want people to stay busy, we need queues. And therefore, uh, things will be waiting there, adding time to your lead time. Also waiting for decisions. If you only can make decisions with a certain amount of people or uh, you have a certain uh, frequency for how you make decisions, you tend to have uh, waiting for decisions. Also waiting for someone to finish their work uh, is very common when you optimize to keeping people busy. Common yellow bricks in your system would be things like rework due to defects, uh, handovers between people in the system, uh, lack of understanding the requirements or uh, what you're supposed to do. That means that we need to redo the work over and over. And in knowledge work, if it stays in a queue too long, the knowledge actually starts to uh, decrease. That means that you might want to, you need to go back and do reanalysis, or the environment has changed, so you have to uh, change uh, what you need to do. Also, overprocessing, that might be things like uh, going back and reprioritize your backlog every week, even if you just select one or two items out of the 200. Uh, doing Excessive reporting in status meeting might also be things that are yellow bricks. So, are you, are you doing some uh, morning meetings, daily stand-up meetings today? Is that a value-added activity or not? So it's value-adding? So if you would do that all day, would your customers be very happy? So it's, it's typically a, a yellow brick, right? So if we could do without them, it would be great because it's not actually adding any value. But we might need to do them just to get, create the true value. So sometimes you need to have some yellow bricks in your system just to make it work. Some numbers. Uh, what I've seen when doing things like value stream mapping, I will have seen uh, that you usually have something like 1 to 5% of the total lead time would be value added time. And the highest numbers I have ever seen is 20%. And I think they actually cheated because they didn't tell me what was happening before the process we mapped. Uh, so you can see that for the total lead time for something, from idea to where actually can start to collect the money, it's very little part of that that is actually value adding time. So the question is how much red and yellow bricks do you have in your processes?
Let's look at the three laws that actually governs how your process operates. Uh, we have the Little's law, law of bottlenecks, and the law of variation. And this applies more or less to all uh, kind of processes in different ways. But let's start with Little's law. So if you look at this picture, this is uh, uh, Essingeleden in, uh, in Stockholm, uh, a highway around the city uh, in the morning. So if I would like to go from here to here, when it looks like this, or if it looks like this, which one do you think will be the fastest one? Rhetorical question, right? So this is the board. If we want to go from here to here, we add something new into the system. Will it go faster in this case or in this case, if we take them sequentially? It's the same thing. The less work you have in the system, the faster something can go through it and you can get feedback if that is the correct uh, work that you have done. And all this is, you can use something called the Little's Law that says work in process through throughput equals your lead time or your cycle time, depending on how you want to define it. And putting some numbers on this, uh, if we have 12 things in the, in the system and we can process 12 things a, a minute, the average lead time here would be one minute. So if we want to increase our performance so we can deliver things faster, the easiest way without changing more or less anything, you can just half the amount of work you have in process and that will actually half your average lead time. And on the opposite side, if you double the amount of work you have in the process and don't change how you operate, you will actually double the lead time. And this applies to more or less every processes as long as we have a more or less uh, equal inflow of work and equal outflow of work. So if you look at this on a, process, uh, on a project level, say we have three projects that we want to run. We do a little bit work on A, a little bit work on B, and a little bit work on C. Uh, and we go through this and we might have a Gantt chart looking like this. But if we switch and we kind of lower the amount of work that we have in process to one, so we work first on project A, then B, then C, we would have a Gantt chart looking something like this. And what might be an economical benefit of doing it in the second way, if we are producing features. Faster feedback. Faster feedback. Time to market. Time to market. And what could be a good beneficial thing about being time to market? On the financial side, it's usually cash flow. So you need to invest less money before you can actually get a payoff. And Sometimes maybe if you do feature A or project A, that might even fund, uh, fund uh, project C. So you don't actually have to uh, lend the money to do it. Law of bottlenecks. Every process have at least one. Getting back to traffic. So you can't go faster than your bottleneck at least not over time. So if this was your system, you have a capacity of six cars a second or a minute uh, up here, and you have a capacity here of four, and you have a capacity of six here. The total capacity of, thru of the throughput of the whole system here will be based on the capacity here at the bottleneck. As long as the capacity in front of the bo bottleneck is greater to or equal to the bottleneck, you will go as fast as your bottleneck. But remember, if you try to fill up the capacity in front of your bottleneck, you actually add on lead time to your system. So you have to be careful to actually add in all the work in front of your, uh, in front of your bottleneck. Uh, if you want to drive down your lead time. And also on the opposite side, uh, as long as capacity is equal or greater to the bottleneck, uh, after the bottleneck, uh, 
you will be able to operate at the speed of the bottleneck but not faster over time. But these are the capabilities that, that you need to have in your system and then maybe you want to change where this bottleneck is in your system and therefore you might want to have some, some overcapacity but you need to manage towards this. The third one, law of variation. So if we have lead time here and we have resource efficiency here, as variation goes up, uh, the, the lead time will exponentially grow. So the higher up in resource efficiency you, you try to go with uh, low variation, uh, you can go a little bit further up, but if the variation goes up, it goes up much, much faster. So if you want to have a short lead time and you have high variability, you need to have very low resource efficiency because otherwise you're not able to uh, keep the lead time low. So some common sources of variation, that would be arrival rate. That means if work is coming to you in bursts or uh, it's coming to you uh, very unregularly. Uh, work size and complexity. Ad hoc processes. Uh, in Scrum, it's been uh, talked about quite a bit that if you have a problem somewhere in the process, you should uh, uh, use swarming and actually go to where you have the problem in the process and all everybody is helping out. And that is actually uh, adding more variability into your process. So depending on if you're just focusing on getting a short result or if you want to build a sustainable cap capability in your system, uh, swarming might be a bad idea. It might be better to keep it more even and trying to actually understand where you have the problems in the process and fixing them for once and not going back to it over and over again. Also, availability, uh, available capacity and available uh, and needed competence are common sources of variation that will generate available capacity and available uh, and needed competence might affect arrival rate for different stages inside the process. So, some common ways to improve flow efficiency. The first one, uh, reduce batch size. That means uh, try to make the features smaller uh, and make them run through the system uh, using minimal viable feature or minimal viable pro product. Try to deliver continuously. Reduce work in progress. Uh, use something like a Kanban system to help you reduce the amount of work that you have in the process. And maybe you have seen this image from some of the lean literature. We have a river uh, where we have a floating boat on top here. Uh, and the more water we have, if we have the water level up here, we don't really see all the problems that we have in the process. So if we want to improve our process, not just in terms of uh, lead time, but also to understand what is actually the problems in the process, we need to start lowering the, the amount of water that we have in the system so we can see the rocks, so we can actually start to eliminate them. So the WIP limit uh, and working with WIP limits in a Kanban system is about trying to lower it as low as possible so you can operate your process uh, and understand where the problems are. So there's no such thing as setting the perfect WIP limit if you're working in a Kanban system. It's about adjusting it all the time to try to find uh, the hidden rocks in the work that you have in your process. When you find them, you can start to eliminate them. And if you can't eliminate them, you might need to raise the water level for some time. So you have the financial muscle to actually go in and blow away this big rock. And when you can do that, you lower it again and again. So uh, when Taichi Ono said uh, the purpose of the Kanban is to 
get rid of the Kanban is all about trying to get to a state where we only have one single piece flow, but we can only do that when we have removed the rocks. <coughs> Improved quality is usually in most software development system uh, a very way, good way to improve flow. Uh, if you implement things like continuous integration, uh, pair programming and uh, test driven development, uh, it will help you improve your software and therefore you have less rework. Uh, also do stop the line and root cause analysis of the defects you find. So doing experiment and, uh, and failing as you heard before uh, is a good thing if you don't fail on the same problems over and over again. So the stop the line and root cause analysis is really about if you find a problem, try to fix it so it goes away and it will not occur again, hopefully. And the last one is uh, reduce process variation. Uh, so reducing the batch size will help you reduce the amount of variation you have in the process. I don't say that you should reduce all variation, but some of the variation that you have in the process is not really necessary to be beneficial for you. You can take out lots of variation that is created by the bad habits that you have in the company. Maybe reduce length or remove iterations altogether because they actually are creating waves of, uh, of work arriving into your system. If you have a sprint, for instance, that is quite long, you have a surge of work coming into a system, and then you try to work it away. And this is just the same thing as we have rush hour in traffic. The morning rush is the start of the sprint, and the evening rush is the next sprint. So if you can even it out, you can actually improve your system. Uh, as I told before, avo avoid swarming and ad hoc processes. Uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't experiment with your processes, but you should try to have uh, control over how you do work, because then it's much, much easier to have, uh, be in a lower state of variation, which means that you can uh, have a bigger use of your uh, people and resources in your system uh, but still have high flow efficiency. So, it's time to choose. Which side do you, do you choose? Do you choose the dark side? Or the bright side, or whatever it's called? Do you want to go for flow efficiency first, or resource efficiency first? Thank you very much.